All right, good afternoon. We have some finishing up to do in both chapters 11 and 6. These are specific stories about how enzymes work. And so we want to have three stories. We're going to actually start with the uh, chapter 11 story because we just finished talking about that. And um, then we'll move on. We'll move on a little bit more to chymotrypsin and then finally hexokinase. So I keep talking about the sodium potassium ATPase. It's really important. And the key thing about how it works is, well, number one, it's driven by ATP because this is the thing that burns much of your ATP in order to keep your cells alive. The cells are alive in part because they have always having sodium pumped out and potassium pumped in. And in fact, there's an imbalance even there. There are three sodiums pumped out for every potassium that's pumped in. This means that you are going to have a charge imbalance across the membrane in addition to the, uh, the concentration imbalance you're going to have in both sodium and potassium. So look at the numbers here. Potassium is higher in the cytosol. Sodium is lower in the cytosol. That makes sense. When the cell's alive, it's constantly pumping potassium in and sodium out. Uh, and the vice versa is true in the extracellular fluid, if you see at the bottom there. But in addition to this, if there were just the same amounts of sodium and potassium being uh, pumped in and out, we would have an equal amount of charge on each side. But because there are only two Ks pumped in for every three sodiums pumped out, it's an antiporter, and this is the way it works. Because of this imbalance in the number of positive ions moving across the membrane, we end up with a live cell has a more negative inside than the positive outside that we have around it. That means uh, that translates to a membrane potential of a certain amount of voltage. In most living cells, this is between 50 to 70 millivolts negative on the inside. So this is what I was talking about. This shows up in that equation that we just talked about. Um, but usually we'll just say the cell's alive, use this number, plug it in for the voltage, make sure it cancels out with the Faraday constant. And that's really all you have to do about it. But the main thing to realize if it's a living cell, normally functioning sodium potassium ATPase, it's going to be more negative on the inside. That means that there's going to be an extra charge voltage force that is helping to pull the sodium inside when you open up a channel. Not only do you have the passive concentration gradient contributing its delta G, you have the membrane potential gradient contributing its delta G. And both of those delta Gs for sodium are negative. In fact, you can go through this many, any uh, number of different ways. It's always the same story with equations. We give you everything but one thing you solve for the unknown. So it's important that you see that this is how neurons work. So we're going to give you some neuron problems. We're going to say that uh, actively functioning neuron is going to have a negative 70 millivolts potential. Um, the neurons in particular are high energy users because they are constantly opening and closing their sodium and potassium doors. Again, more on that in chapter 12 as to why. The main thing is that they use their sodium potassium ATPase, they use their voltage gradient. They use it far more than other cells. And that's why neurons are so expensive. You're always burning ATP to keep the voltage balanced in the face of all these sodium and potassium moving in and out that are helping the nerve to fire. In fact, it's so extensive, uh, so expensive and extensive that 25% of all your ATP, as you're sitting right there, it might be a little more than 25% because hopefully you're keeping up with this and your brain is moving and you're figuring out how to reorient your brain pathways and your neurons are firing. So that means that if you're just sitting there watching TV, probably 25% of your ATP is going to this one protein. If you're thinking hard, it might be more than 25% because they're firing and it is working as fast as it can to keep the voltage negative and at the resting voltage of negative 50 to negative 70. Here's a good quote from Bill Bryson. In a given moment, a typical cell in your body will have about 1 billion ATP molecules in it. In two minutes, every one of them will have been drained dry, hydrolyzed, and another billion will have taken their place. Every day, you produce and use up a volume of ATP equivalent to about half your body weight. There, I have a few 
issues with this metaphor, but yeah, it's technically true. Feel the warmth of your skin. That is your ATP at work. We'll talk about how um, warm-blooded animals create heat using another transporter that moves things across a membrane. But again, that's a Biochem 2 topic. Right now, we're just talking about how things in general work. So if you remember this old video from Drake, I'm sad to say it seems like a new video to me, but uh, there's this video where he does a move or he moves, he does two moves to the right, he does three moves to the left, and then he kicks. So the two moves to the right are like moving the, the potassium in, the three moves to the left are like moving sodium out, and the kick is like burning an ATP to do it. It takes more, um, well, you'll calculate how much ATP it takes to move certain amount of ions in and out. I believe it's one ATP per, th uh, per three, per two, but um, you have a homework problem that I believe refers to that. In fact, this is so important. It's important not just to us, but it's important to all animals to keep this ATPase running so that your cells maintain the voltage gradient that keeps them alive, that keeps the sodium flowing in the right direction. So uh, even for this case, this is sea urchins. And they're looking at sea urchin larvae uh, versus embryos, and they're comparing how much of their ATP is going to different places. And so the um, black is ATP given to protein synthesis. That's a lot of enzymes. Gray is ATP allocated to one single protein in all the cells, but it's the sodium potassium ATPase. So everything else is white. But I want you to notice that what they did is they looked at embryos versus larvae when they're feeding and when they're not. The numbers are typically the gray numbers, which is ATPase numbers, are around 15%. When they've fed, they actually are putting more toward that particular thing, and they go up to 25%. But under high CO2 conditions, life's harder for them and they are burning more ATP just to stay in place. They are running to stand still. And so what you have there is you have, instead of 15% of their ATP going to the ATPase, when you have high CO2, it goes up to 22%. And then when they feed, it goes all the way up to 35%, depending on their age. That's a pretty big difference. And that is one protein, but it's such an important protein. That's why we're looking at it. And so this is one of the reasons why CO2 worries oceanographers. They see how high CO2 stresses out the organisms, and suddenly you're putting almost double as much ATP into this one protein just to stay alive. That's how important it is. And I always want to know what these things look like. Here's a structure of what it looks like. Guess what? It's complicated. Um, it's got lots of different subunits. It sits in the membrane. It has conformational changes. And uh, actually, it's related to a plant proton transporter. So on the top, you have the sodium potassium ATPase, and on the left. And on the right, bottom right, you have a plant proton transporter. But what's cool about it is even at this level of detail, you can see that the proton pump looks like the ATPase. And it's pretty easy to evolve a proton pump into a sodium pump. And that's exactly what it looks like happened. And so these things are all connected. You can really get into it. Um, but the important thing is it's an important molecule for everyone, even plants. It's just a proton transporter in plants. Big deal, right? So um, if we want to finish the story about inhibition, there are inhibitors that work on the sodium potassium ATPase. One of them is called Wabane which is actually found in foxglove, and it might be a component of some traditional medicines as well. Digitalis is what one kind of extract from foxglove is found, and digitalis is active because of the wabane molecule in it. Now, just looking at it, you're like, okay, what does it do? But what it does is it sits in the middle of the pore and it blocks it, and it blocks the ATPase. And that sounds really bad, and it is really bad. This is a toxin if you take too much. But if you just take a little, you can actually have a good effect. Because if you just block the sodium potassium ion transport just enough, if you have heart failure, you are already in a bad situation. So you take what looks like a step worse. You give them a toxin. But this toxin blocks the sodium potassium ATPase. And then there's a backup plan. The backup plan being activated is actually a sodium calcium antiporter. And that gets calcium into the cell as it gets sodium out of the cell. 
And that means that in the context of the heart, that will actually kickstart muscle contraction. And that is why giving someone a toxin can actually restart their heart. I think that's really cool, so I think you um, should study it. You should know that that kind of thing can happen. You also have some examples in your homework of how these things work. The final thing in this area that can work is you can inhibit not by dis by blocking the door, like boarding up the door, but you can inhibit by opening up a window beside the door. If the window will let things move down their passive gradient, then the membrane is basically not there anymore. And the whole point to the membrane is to keep the potassium in, right? Well, if you add something that opens up a window for potassium, then the potassium flows out. And there can be small molecules that just have hydrophobic outsides and hydrophilic insides that bind potassium or bind other ions. And these are called ionophores because if you have this simple combination of properties, hydrophobic outside, hydrophilic inside that binds, it's like a little donut, um, a hydrophilic inside that binds potassium. This will be a toxin as well, because what it will do is it will allow potassium to flow down the, across the membrane, flow down its concentration gradient, and um, it will all go out of the cell and then the cell will be disrupted. The cell won't have the voltage it needs anymore. In fact, this is how valinomycin works. It actually binds potassium ions and moves across the membrane. Something about our membranes is actually resistant to its moving across them, and so that's why valinomycin is not as toxic to us as it is to bacteria. But uh, you just see how, the, how ionophores work by bringing one concentration set closer to equilibrium and messing up the voltage. Here's another case where yeast actually makes an ionophore to compensate for a mutation in an important transporter. In the wild type situation, you have one transporter that is moving protons out in yeast, and you have one transporter that's moving potassium in. Both of these are moving down their concentration gradient, and so they can move passively. But the thing is, uh, uh, some scientists did some, uh, they were looking at what happens if you mutate that, um, that transporter, the potassium transporter is mutated, so no longer can the potassium move in, well, the protons are still flowing out, but you don't have as much potassium getting in, and the yeast can't grow under those cases. They don't exactly die, but they're not happy either. So um, when you have that mutant, the, they found some interesting things because some yeast had a backup plan for the mutant situation. When the, uh, when the one thing was lost, they made a small molecule that would actually replace the potassium transporter. And so this molecule is called amphotericin B, and what it actually does is when the yeast makes it, all of a sudden it goes to the membrane and it opens up a window for potassium that lets them go through. So this doesn't look like the ionophore that we had on the last one, the valinomycin, and yet it's acting as one, so what's going on with it? They investigated it and they found that this molecule, amphotericin B, will actually form a ring. It will act like the alpha helices that we've seen in other transporters. And it will form a ring with a hollow opening. It will span the membrane. It has a hydrophobic side and a hydrophilic inside. And this will open up a hole that will let the potassium through. This allows the yeast to grow again. They're happy. Um, something like this wouldn't work for a complex thing like us, but it works for yeast. And it's a very cool biochemistry. So I want you to see all these things are coming together. This is a review slide of everything we've talked about. We have the uncatalyzed diffusion reaction in the upper left. Then we have facilitated diffusion, which is where you make a transporter that catalyzes that movement. Then you have active transport, where you have ATP being burned to move something in or out or both. And uh, finally, um, we have ionophores, which will move ions across, small molecules that can move ions across the membrane, and they will disrupt these, uh, the, all the hard work of the ATPase that's burned all this ATP to set up a voltage. It will disrupt that voltage. So if you can understand how all these things work, and if you can go through the homework and understand that, then you've got the understanding that you need for test three. And these are the homework problems that I'm talking about. And just note that homework 6b will include some end of chapter problems from chapter 11. Okay, but that's one important enzyme. And there's just two other stories to finish up talking about. What is the evidence for how these things work? And this is another good example of how to use these enzyme parameters, how to think about them.
So let's go back to chymotrypsin just one more time. Chymotrypsin is a nice little protease, and that means that it will cut amide bonds. You can make it, the peptide really short. In fact, sometimes you can make it just down to just two residues long, and it will still cut that peptide. For example, substrate A there, that's not much longer than two residues, but it will still actually work. It won't work super well, but it will. the KCAT over KM is two. That's a really low number, but it's big enough to measure in the lab. And so if you use substrate A, you find that the K-cat for that substrate is 0.06 and the Km is 31 millimolar. Um, not great numbers, but enough to measure in the lab. And it makes sense that substrate A is how chymotrypsin works because remember, chymotrypsin cuts bonds next to aromatic residues. And at least you've got the aromatic residue and the bond right next to it. You don't have much else, but you've got that. So what happens if they add more? How much does adding more stuff to the bare minimum help the reaction go along? Substrate B is where they've added more, uh, they've added more backbone and not even really a side chain. And it actually is a little better in KM, like twice as low, and it's a little faster in KCAT, so it's about five times better. But then if they just go through and they add one methyl group at the right place, and it's a methyl group at a place where the side chain should be on this chain. So if you add the main chain, you get five times better. If you add just a methyl group on top of that, you get 10 times better. And this suggests that the side chain is particularly important to how the enzyme works. And you can say it's important to binding. It's actually not as important to binding as it is to catalysis, something about having the amide bond be in the right conformation, having it go through the um, hydrolysis process. And I can say that because the KM has actually gotten a little bit worse, but the KCAT has gotten a lot better. And that's why I'm saying that it's not helping binding, but it's helping catalysis when you look at substrate C. Again, you'll get practice with this. This is how to do the homework, how to think about the homework. Another thing you can do is you can just uh, go up from the side chain and to add this is working on the side chain that is the aromatic side chain. If you have a substrate and you have a substrate that works even with glycine, you know, it, it will, let's start with phenylalanine. It works with phenylalanine on the bottom. You have one times 10 to the fifth. So this isn't the best substrate, but it's not the worst either. And then you ask the question of what happens if we sort of melt that substrate down, if we reduce it down to a smaller side chain, uh, how much does that matter? and the KCAT over KM gets worse, and you can talk about how much it gets worse. This isn't broken down into KCAT or KM, but I'd be interested to know. I would predict that this would affect KM more than KCAT because it has to do with binding, not with the bond itself. But maybe I'd be wrong. You have to do the experiment to find out. So all this comes together to say, and this is a picture of one of these substrates actually in the hydrophobic pocket there. And when they uh, did a bunch of mutations, they found that there were three mutations that wouldn't affect KM that much, but they would affect KCAT a lot. Glycine 193, serine 195, and HIS 57. Oh, actually, I, I take that back. The glycine 193, it's actually a backbone atom that works. So the side chains that you remove are the ASP, HIS, and serine. And you see that these four residues are actually located. They're, they're dispersed throughout the, um, throughout the chain. And so they knew, this was before they had the structure, that they knew these four residues were important. But they also knew because they're dispersed throughout the chain, these must be brought together. And these must be right next to the binding site because we know that these affect K-cat, not K-M, but they still affect how it goes. This must be the catalytic machinery. We've talked about how serine-195 works. We talked about how HIS-57 works. Go back and review that if you've forgotten. But we talked about each of those. And this is where they, how they figured it out. There's one thing I don't want to leave you hanging because we showed serine 95. And by the way, the base is the histidine that's right next to it. Histidine 57 is the base that's shown right here. But um, remember how we said that we walked you through how the bond is broken, but we still had a covalent bond to the serine. Um, so we had, to, uh, we had to say, what is the evidence that we have a covalent bond being formed? Um, what happens after this? And those two questions. So number one, what is the evidence for covalent catalysis in this case? It's called the acyl intermediate because the serine is bound to the substrate with a acyl bond that later has to be broken. 
the way they found this out is they used this substrate right here. And you see it's bare bones substrate for chymotrypsin. It's just got a fennel ring. It's got something you can hydrolyze. But when it's produced, it produces a color change, which is why they used it. When the molecule on the left is produced, I believe it is a blue color. So this bare bones sort of substrate will actually work with the enzyme and it will produce a blue colored product. And uh, they knew that there was a fast step that happened first. And then there was a, a slow step where you had to get rid of the bond. So breaking the bond actually happened quickly. And then you had to do some stuff after the bond was broken. This is what they saw. This is actually a weird time graph. Look at time is on the x-axis. And what they saw is they saw the line go up really fast. They called that the burst phase. And it always went up to about where enough product was produced that one, uh, an, one mole of product was produced for every mole of enzyme they had in solution. If you notice, that's what the y-axis is saying right there. It's basically bursting up really fast. This is not a hyperbola. Um, and so because of that, they knew that they had to use um, other, something else was going on beyond simple michaelis minton kinetics. So um, they, they said there was a slow phase, which must be uh, slower than actually breaking the bond and producing the product. Once the slow phase was done, then the whole enzyme would turn over slowly and produce more product. So from these two different kinetics, this is not a hyperbola. And they knew there were two steps because you had a non-hyperbola with the slow step being after the product producing step. They eventually found out this was the deacylation phase where you break that acyl bond. And it happens, the fast phase only happens until you've produced one substrate per enzyme and it comes first. So they um, did some more work and they figured out you need water to do the slow step and you produce acetic acid. And so they did some stuff with pH, they did some uh, a lot of things, and they found out that acetic acid is produced by the slow step, and that um, then they got into the mechanism of what was what are the steps you have to do to break that acyl bond. And I'm going to give you a homework question about it, but I'm going to have you refer to a figure and interpret that figure to do the homework question. From this fact, I'm not expecting you to remember all these steps but I'm expecting you to be able to interpret a figure like that if I give you a figure that's new. So use it the right way. Don't study it um, so that you memorize the steps, but be able to understand what the steps are, what order they are in. One more story is for um, one more protein that shows, we haven't showed you a good example of induced fit. Hexokinase is a good example of induced fit. So the one thing is you look at this and uh, we have different types of reactions and we said we had different types of enzymes. This is also a new type of enzyme because this is a group transfer reaction. What you have is the group being transferred is phosphate. Phosphate starts off on the ATP, hexokinase breaks that phosphate bond and moves it to glucose. So you are transferring the phosphate. You aren't just breaking the ATP. What would be the point of that? You're using the ATP's energy to be able to transfer the phosphate onto a um, glucose. And if you know glycolysis, and if you don't, you'll find out next quarter, the first step in glycolysis is moving the phosphate to that, um, to that C6 position of glucose. We'll talk more about sugar structure just coming up. The main thing here, group transfer reaction, very important, but what you have to do is you have to have an OH on the sugar attacking the phosphate. There's a whole bunch of OHs around in water. Water is full of OHs. And the thing that you have to worry about is if you just had a regular old enzyme, well, then that enzyme would bind water because water gets everywhere, right? The enzyme would bind ATP and then it would uh, immediately have water in the, in the active site that attacks the ATP and hydrolyzes it. Then you don't have ATP anymore and you don't have glycolysis and you die because you don't get any energy from your sugar. So the enzyme has to discriminate between the OH on the, uh, on the um, sugar and the OH in water. Usually this is done just by doing some kind of PKA trick. You make it only work at the PKA of the group that you want to transfer it to. But here there's a problem. All of sugar's OH groups have a PKA similar to that of water. So you can't do that trick. Instead, the enzyme does another trick. 
What it does is you can find it if you look at the uh, x-ray crystal structure. And the x-ray crystal structure of it bound looks like this. You have the sugar in red in the middle there. Unbound, you have it way open. And the other thing is that when you go back and forth, bound and unbound, the ATP binding site is right going out from the sugar. It's like at the four o'clock position. If this was a clock, it would be, oh, I'm sorry, not the four o'clock position, an eight o'clock position. I've got to get the clock right in my head. But it basically goes out from the sugar. The cleft forms the ATP binding site. In the bound site, you have the cleft itself for binding the ATP. In the unbound, there's no way for ATP to bind because its binding site is spread out like that. So this is a case where the sugar binds first. In, in the case of induced fit, then the ATP site binds. So the ATP cannot bind until the sugar is already there. And that is why this works so well. The ATP can't be hydrolyzed by water because the ATP can't be bound until the sugar is there replacing the water. In fact, we can see that this works if we use a little trick. If we use a shorter sugar that does not have the C6, which is the catalytic part, but it has all of the other carbons, which are the binding parts, this sugar will still bind. This is xylose, and it will actually bind. It will trick the hexokinase into closing, and then ATP will bind, but it will transfer to water because there is no carbon-6 for the phosphate to bind to. This is why xylose will actually interrupt glycolysis, and it will work as an inhibitor for this particular enzyme. That might be in the homework. At least the story is something that I want you to know um, for the test. When you add xylose as an inhibitor, the enzyme will actually work just fine for ATP, but it will transfer its phosphate to water. You'll have just, congratulations, you've just made an ATP hydrolysis machine. And that will completely get you ready for, uh, will completely finish off this. All right, so I hope you have a good weekend. We'll get started with sugars on Monday. I look for when the quiz is. I don't think I'm making you take the sugar quiz yet, but you can certainly go ahead and get started on it early to help learn a little bit about sugars before we get started on Monday. Monday, Wednesday are sugars, Friday is review, and then the test is a week from Monday. All right, so see you next Monday.